Great. Um, welcome, everyone, um, to this first seminar or the webinar of the, the One Health and Wash Network um, with a the theme making links between stenosis, food production and wash. My name is Christina Ospia. I am working as a researcher at the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences um, and I will moderate um, this webinar today um, that will focus on, on One Health perspectives to address overlooked links between stenosis, food production and wash. Uh, and as I mentioned, that the webinar is organized by the newly started uh, One Health and Wash Network. Um, the network is under development and you will hear more about it in the first presentation by Sarah Dickin. And the, the network will organize a series of open webinars during 2022. Uh, we have quite an intense schedule in, ahead of us uh, and we have three very knowledgeable speakers and some time for questions as well practicalities for you. Please keep your microphones muted throughout the webinar. Um, questions for the presenters are preferably posted in the chat. You can write your, write your questions in English or in French, since we have some French speakers here today as well. And, and the post questions will be read out to the presenters uh, after the presentations. Uh, and you're also very welcome and to post your name, your affiliation and your country in the chat so that we see who is actually joining the webinar today. Uh, the webinar is recorded and a link to the webinar will be posted on our network webpage. And, and we will also post the PDFs of these presentations. And uh, we are working on establishing some kind of newsletter um, for, for more information sharing on, on the network events. With that, uh, I would like to invite our first speaker, which is Dr. Sarah Dickin, who has a background in health geography and is working as team leader on sanitation and health at the Stockholm Environment Institute, SEI. And, and Dr. Sarah will provide an introduction to our One Health Wash Network uh, and also to the concept and the linkages between One Health and Wash. Over to you, Sarah. Great, thank you. Um... Can you see my presentation? Yes, we see it very well. Okay, um, great. And hopefully the sound's working. I'm getting a message about poor network, but uh, let me know if there's any issues. Um, so hi everyone, and thank you, Christina, for that introduction. So um, yeah, I um, based at SCI. SCI is one of the coordinating organizations for this uh, recently started uh, Network on Wash and One Health, together with SLU. <clears throat> and uh, I just want to give you a bit of a background today before we get into our two uh, cases that will be presented about the network, what we're planning to do, and also about why today's topic is so important. Um, so this network was recently established. It's about a one-year project uh, to build up a network of international and transdisciplinary collaborators working um, across One Health and WASH issues. So this means uh, it includes people working on veterinarian science, um, agricultural sciences, um, gender development studies, uh, uh, public health, WASH issues, and so on. Um, one of the aims is to develop proposals uh, for work beyond the initial network period. So the network is really aiming to kickstart things and to lead to more collaborative projects um, among members um, and also to create a space for science to policy dialogue. So um, seminars like today, discussions to uh, further uh, collaboration and so on. We have a number of activities that we're planning for this network. So uh, one of those is regular engagement through seminars like today's seminar, which is the first one in the series. We have a few more planned for this year on different topics. We're also planning to do some scoping studies, looking at some of these issues, um, particularly in three uh, countries that are involved with the network, which includes uh, Kenya, Burkina Faso, and Mozambique. We're planning some workshops in order to support proposal development um, for both research and capacity building initiatives. Uh, we'll also be producing some reports that come out of these other activities and also probably some, some briefs and some materials about um, sort of our view of how WASH and One Health uh, can be better connected. So this is what you can expect over the coming year from the network. Um, and now I want to provide a bit of a background for today's topic. Uh, so 
one of the challenges with uh, bringing together actors from the One Health sector and WASH is that we often have different starting points, uh, different language and ways of talking about things. So I wanted to lay some things out for everyone uh, to be on the same page. Um, so first of all, when we say WASH, what are we referring to? This refers to um, a suite of interventions that are often grouped together, which includes drinking water and uh, household water. Uh, it includes sanitation, which is uh, partly about toilets, but it's also about uh, safe management of human excreta along the entire chain. So that's uh, also collection of waste, management of waste, treatments, potential uh, reuse or disposal uh, in a safe manner. And then also hygiene, uh, which can include um, hand washing with soap, but also other forms of hygiene, um, like menstrual hygiene, food hygiene, environmental hygiene, and so on. Uh, so in the wash sector, one of the biggest challenges that we're facing today um, is the lack of uh, safely managed sanitation services. So nearly half the world's population lacks these uh, safely managed services. Um, and almost uh, 2 billion actually lack basic sanitation services. So this is an even lower rung on the so-called sanitation ladder. Um, and then of that, 500 million people still practice open defecation. And so what this presents is a big challenge in terms of widespread exposure to human feces and related health risks uh, related to diarrheal diseases and other types of uh, enteric infections. Diarrheal diseases is a huge uh, public health um, threat. It uh, kills around 1.45 million people a year and it disproportionately impacts children under five. Um, and diarrhea also contributes, it's one of the leading causes of malnutrition as well because of the links between um, diarrhea and stunting. You can see some progress is being made here on this chart on the right, um, but progress is still quite slow in terms of improving sanitation access. So what about One Health? Um, some of you might be familiar with One Health, um, but overall it's an approach which aims to balance um, the health of people, animals and ecosystems. It recognizes that these are all interconnected and intrinsically linked. Um, the health of humans, um, animals, plants, and the wider environment um, are all interdependent. And One Health usually takes an intersectoral approach and also working across different levels, so from local, regional, national, and global levels, and so on. And one of the big challenges for a One Health approach or a reason to apply a One Health approach is to address uh, the burden of zoonotic disease. And these are diseases uh, which threaten both the health and productivity of animals, um, people's livelihoods, um, and also cause a range of diseases um, and burden of disease uh, in humans. Um, so when we look at exposure to animal feces and the health risks here, well, first of all, uh, food animals actually produce four times more fecal matter than humans. So there's actually a much larger challenge here. Um, in high income countries, this leads to exposure through animal food production systems. And in low and middle income countries, exposure can occur in food systems, but also in the domestic environment itself. So um, in many households, you can find domestic animals, um, particularly Southeast Asia and Africa. So there's very close interactions between uh, humans and animals. And this is good in one sense that the livestock provide an important source of food and health benefits for food security. But then also there are health risks with this uh, close interaction. And so there's, there can be zoonotic transmission of enteric diseases as well. And these have been a little bit overlooked actually. So why are we trying to link WASH and One Health? What are the connections? Well, WASH approaches, traditionally just address the human aspect of One Health. So they provide sanitation services to uh, protect humans from uh, human excreta and the risks there. Uh, but we think that there are, there's potential for uh, much broader linkages, um, that, that WASH approaches can actually support One Health in all three dimensions. So this includes um, reducing the burden of pathogens and organic matter entering the environment that can cause um, ecosystem degradation. And that's both from animal excreta and human excreta, but also uh, wash approaches can help uh, reduce, reduce pathogen transmission between animals and humans. Um, so it's not just about uh, human excreta, there's also potential to uh, reduce risks from animal excreta as well. 
So why is this uh, interconnected approach so important? Um, so one reason, as I've said, is that there's a large burden of diarrheal disease, both from human and animal origin, and potential to, to address this uh, together. The global emergence of AMR is another challenge. Um, so AMR is important uh, from both a human health and animal health perspective, and WASH is a kind of upstream intervention that can help to reduce infections in the first place. Another reason from the WASH sector is actually that there have been a number of high quality uh, trials that have been done in recent years where uh, the expected decreases of diarrhea and stunting were not actually found. So the expected health outcomes were not observed. And uh, one hypothesis for this among a number of reasons is that these interventions, so they were just addressing household water uh, supply, sanitation and hand washing with soap, was that they didn't address exposure to animal excreta and that this then meant that there were still uh, a number of different transmission pathways uh, leading to uh, risk of diarrhea, particularly among children. Um, so without addressing animals, these interventions were not really doing enough. So what's being done at the moment? Well, uh, we can see in the WHO guidelines on sanitation and health that they do promote um, an approach approach uh, with coordination with other interventions. So beyond sanitation, also water supply, hygiene, and animal feces. Um, so this is included here in these guidelines, but what we see in reality is that one health approaches are rarely applied in the wash sector and animals are not really uh, addressed. Uh, so there are many gaps in understanding the complex transmission pathways and behaviors. and. WASH interventions alone are considered complex interventions because of the different interactions between infrastructure, technology, behavior, um, institutional aspects, and so on. So then thinking about how to also bring in um, animal aspects, management of animals, and food production, and so on, adds another layer of complexity. Uh, but some, some final messages. Uh, we need to address this complexity. Um, animal feces do present a risk, particularly for children, um, but they haven't been address, addressed in the WASH sector. At the same time, many One Health practitioners um, and researchers don't formally work with WASH interventions. So maybe they have some components of that, but it's not formally addressed and there aren't um, necessarily collaborations between those two groups of actors. Um, so we really do need a One Health approach to a for WASH uh, and that can help us with uh, risk prioritization. So to understand where we should put most of our attention when there are limited resources for interventions, for example, to know where what presents the greatest health risk um, and, and also to coordinate interventions to uh, ensure that they're more effective. So what we're proposing with this network is to move from WASH. Um, there has been some proposals to include animals as part of WASH uh, with the letter A, because that doesn't actually stand for anything in the acronym. But we also think that we can go beyond just, just animals and really take a more integrated One Health approach. So One Health approach to WASH, um, not just thinking about animals, but thinking about um, the environment and all the different interlinkages. So uh, that's a bit of a background for today's presentation. And I'll just end by reminding you that we have a few more webinars that will be coming up on other related topics. Um, so we'll have a webinar coming up focusing more on aspects of AMR uh, specifically, and then another one on environmental dimensions um, of One Health and WASH. Um, so stay tuned, we'll have more information about um, the dates of those webinars and the presenters um, that will be coming up after this one. So thanks for your attention, I'll pass it back over to Christina now. Thanks a lot, Sarah, for providing that introduction both to the network and to the concept of why we have, why we need to, to look more into the linkages between One Health and WASH. Um, and for those of you that have joined during Sarah's presentation, uh, uh, you have joined the, the One Health uh, and WASH network first seminar, uh, meeting with a theme making links between stenosis, food production and WASH. Um, please introduce yourself in the chat and um, please be encouraged to post questions to our presenters in the chat as well. Our next presenter 
um, is Dr. Elizabeth Adi Cook, who is a veterinary epidemiologist who is based at the International Livestock Research Institute, ILRI, in Nairobi, Kenya. And she is also affiliated to the University of Liverpool. Um, Dr. Anne will present to us data on an ongoing research study in Mozambique and Kenya that is looking at uh, urban infant foodscapes. And Anne will present some of the data from the Dagoretti sub county in Kenya. With that, Anne, I would like to hand over to you and please uh, share your presentation. Thank you very much, Christina. Um, oh, I'll just make this uh, presentation mode. I hope everybody can see my presentation. Perfect. Okay, hi everybody. Um, my name is Annie Cook. I'm a veterinary epidemiologist at Ilry, and I'm going to be discussing today an ongoing project, as Christina said, um, that really fits into everything that Sarah just described. So I might actually skip over some information as we go, because um, you, you'll see as, as I describe it, how well it kind of covers that one health and wash um, approach. So uh, I'm based at Ilry, and uh, this is a collaborative project across two countries. Um, so the collaboration is between the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and ILRI and CISPOP in Mozambique. So we have a study site in Nairobi and a study site in Mozambique. It's funded by um, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and FCDO in the UK. Uh, oh, oh dear, let me try and advance these slides. Um, Okay, so um, just a brief overview, a uh, little bit of background on foodborne disease, uh, although Sarah did cover this quite well, um, and then mostly about the study design of the Urban Infant Foodscapes project, and I'll spend quite a little bit of time on the design because as we said it's an ongoing project and the results are preliminary but interesting from that livestock one health wash um, aspect as you'll see uh, so just run through the aims and the study sites um, where we do the research or what we call the domains uh, the data collection tools that we use um, some very preliminary results and, and what we're planning for next so as Sarah said, foodborne disease, um, it has a, a very high burden globally with, um, with over half a billion cases a year. And the burden is predominantly in young children and in low and middle income countries. Um, and it's a second um, most common cause of preventable illness and death among children. And we see a relationship with children, weaning children, moving from breastfeeding to solid foods and drinking water uh, because they're losing that passive protection. Protection, um, that they gain from breastfeeding. So uh, what are the causes? Um, the foodborne disease results from ingestion of foods that are contaminated with other microorganisms and chemical or chemicals. And we've got a table below uh, with a list of some of the key ones and, and many of these are actually zoonoses uh, and, and the contamination can occur at any stage in that food production process, either at the, the site that the food is grown or um, sold through to consumption. Uh, and then uh, in the, the, um, the contamination can be from the environment, from water, soil, air, or, or obviously from people handling the food. So we, uh, we have a, I'll explain shortly, a TACMAN array card that will test for all of the um, pathogens uh, on it that are listed under bacteria, viruses, and parasites in the samples that we've collected. Uh, we're not specifically targeting uh, chemicals, but I'll explain that in a little bit. Um, oh, sorry, that they're the ones in the box. <laughs> so uh, what are the risk factors? Uh, as Sarah uh, described, um, there, are, there are many associated with wash and sanitation. So poor personal hygiene, inadequate sanitation, um, uh, uh, food handling, animal contact, contaminated water or cross contamination from other foods, um, particularly chickens and, and the use of um, surfaces, uh, like pulp, sorry, chicken meat. Um, we see that quite commonly in all situations. So the Urban Infant Foodscape, what is it all about? Um, and how did it come about? So the aims of this project were to look at the foodborne burden in young children in low income, high density urban environments. Um, and the aim was to look at a cross-sectional study. So it wasn't just disease. Uh, we, we were also looking at the possibility of enteric carriage of these pathogens in the gut of asymptomatic children. So it was a cross-sectional study and I'll spend some time describing that. So it wasn't targeted at children with diarrhea, which many of these studies are. 
Um, so uh, we were to measure the microbial contamination of the food that was consumed by these children, and then to understand the risk factors of foodborne disease in the children. And, and to look at those risk factors, both at the household, and these are the domains I'm talking about, the household, the local market, and also from the supply or production chain. And finally, using all that information from the first three aims and objectives, we will, our plan is to design and implement a locally appropriate intervention um, that that will address uh, the exposure to micro microbially contaminated eh, microbially contaminated foods okay so our study sites as i mentioned it's a it's a multi-country study uh, we have a study site here in kenya which is uh, on the within nairobi county it's actually in dagareti south sub county and we selected two wards uh, to work in uh, uthiru ruthamita and Uruta. Uh, we have a sister project in Mozambique. I won't speak about that today. They are just starting their data collection, hopefully very soon, um, so we don't have any results. But the design is very similar, so we'll concentrate on Nairobi today. We selected these sites because they're peri-urban uh, on the edge of, um, of, of Nairobi, uh, particularly, and uh, the, the households tend to be overcrowded and the living environment. Um, there's limited wash infrastructure. There's quite a bit of livestock keeping, which we'll talk about, um, and, uh, and there's challenges within these environments. And we believe there was a high risk of, of foodborne disease or hypothesized that. So uh, as I've mentioned previously, there are four domains. Um, there's the child, and we uh, specified the age group of children that we wanted to sample is six to 24 months. So these are weaning children. Uh, there's the household, the market, and the producers or suppliers. So just talking about the child and the household first. Now, uh, as I mentioned to you, our study site was Dagoretti South Sub County and in those two wards. So within the wards, we worked with the, the community health structure. So within Kenya, we have a structure of a government level public health uh, prom promoter, let's call them, called a community health assistant. Now under them are about one, for each of those there are about 100 volunteers called community health volunteers. And they are responsible for health promotion around vaccination, nutrition, maternal health um, within their community. So these community health volunteers live within the community um, and they're active with promoting vaccination and, and nutrition. Uh, we, uh, we worked with the sub-county government to get a list of those volunteers. Once we had the list, we made a random selection of 100 community health volunteers, and each community health volunteer provided a list of the households that they were responsible for. Now, most community health volunteers are responsible for about 100 households. So, um, so we ended up with about 88 community health volunteers who, who were enrolled in the study. Um, so uh, a large number of households, but obviously uh, they're responsible for about 100 households, but not every household has a child less than two years of age. So it ranged from about 10 to, to 40 households that had children in the age group. And then from those lists, we randomly selected seven per household. Um, so a, a little bit over 600 uh, households to, to be involved in the study. And, uh, and we, we, we had, a, we'll, we'll speak in a little bit about how successful we were at recruiting the households. So when we reached the household, what were we actually going to do? So we had a nurse on the study who went together with the CHV to each household and was introduced. Um, they carried uh, a backpack full of materials with them to collect both uh, a questionnaire data or a survey data using a questionnaire tool on a tablet and then other samples. So the, the first step was the survey that they administered to the caregiver of the child um, and that had questions about their age, the foods that they ate, their food preferences, where they bought those foods, um, where they sourced water, whether the child had been on well recently or on any medication um, and any other risk factors. We collected a food sample. Now, this food sample that we collected from each household was a ready prepared, ready to eat food. So what the child would eat at the next meal, the next time the child needed a snack. Um, and so those samples varied from, from yogurt to, um, you know, to, uh, to vegetables, to beans, to, it was a large variety of food types. 
Um, then uh, we collected a water sample from the household. We collected a dried blood spot from each child. Um, we were in the field, so we didn't want to do a venous blood sample. It was much easier to, to collect the blood sample from a, from a finger prick onto a protein saver card. Um, and we collected a stool sample. And this was avoided stool sample, so we would leave a packet of diapers with each caregiver and instruct them on how to use them. And then they, we had a motorbike rider uh, on call. And so as soon as the child had passed stool, um, and there was an hour, there was a time limit on that so that the stool reached the, the lab in time. So it was only if a child passed stool between 8 a.m. and 2 p.m. that we would take the sample and then the rider would pick up the, the diaper with the voided stool and, uh, and deliver it to the laboratory um, right away. So unfortunately, and the reason for selecting the study site in, actually in some ways was that it's very close to our laboratory. So we didn't have long delays in getting those samples to the laboratory and getting them processed. We also collected fecal samples from any livestock who are in the compound. Now I've said compound here because not every caregiver owned livestock, but their neighbors often did. So we recruited um, some of the neighboring households where the, the livestock might've been free roaming in the compound and then the children would have been exposed um, to those livestock or at least had contact with them. Um, we then went on to do observations of the household food preparation. This was quite an intensive process where we asked the caregiver to prepare food um, and usually took a couple of hours. So we did that in about 100 households. Uh, we finally did focus group discussions with 100 caregivers, so 10 focus group discussions with 10 caregivers each to, um, to get ideas about how they prepare food, what they thought the risk factors were um, for contaminating food, um, what their food preferences and, and where they purchase food uh, and finally um, we actually f felt and when we did the study design it was pre-COVID-19 uh, so we thought that daycare centres where children in this age group were dropped off might also be a place that children could be exposed to contaminated food and so um, we recruited daycares as well but with the COVID-19 outbreak um, we uh, there was a change in, in in people sending their children to daycare and so we weren't as successful at recruiting those daycare centres as we'd hoped but we, we certainly found them just um, a little it was a little harder than anticipated. Um, and then I uh, just uh, the next domain that I talked about was the local market. So we would ask the 100. So we um, the uh, target sample size was 500 households with 500 children recruited. Um, and we um, but then randomly selected 100 households to participate in the food purchasing observations. Sorry, to participate in the household food preparation observations. And we asked the same caregivers to go shopping. So from our original questionnaire data we identified seven key priority foods um, so I apologize I haven't listed them here but they were milk matoki which is a type of cooked banana um, rice porridge uh, fruit vegetables and ugali which is a maize meal that's commonly consumed here so we had seven priority food groups when we went to the household and we observed the food preparation we'd ask the caregiver to go shopping um, and to buy something that they needed in the house within those seven priority food groups um, and then we would actually purchase a sample from the mother after she'd done so we'd observe her purchasing the food and how she carried it and ask her some questions associated with that him or her actually it was a caregiver um, but and we'd also collect um, a food sample for testing and then finally uh, the idea was to follow the value chain of these child uh, foods back uh, to the producers and suppliers it ended up being a lot more difficult than we anticipated because the vendors couldn't always tell us where they purchased their foods because obviously it changed seasonally um, and we were trying to identify uh, producers that were within the study area where we might be able to implement an intervention because obviously if the producer was in a different county it would be hard for us to um, implement an intervention along that value chain. So uh, in the end, what we did was use our community health volunteers to identify uh, producers who were in the study area and were likely to supply to vendors. So we didn't have a direct link, but these um, are often uh, smallholder farmers who have a small number of cattle and milk their cattle and sell it at the farm gate. Um, there are also some matoki growers or uh, vegetable and fruit sellers. 
Now, we because that didn't cover all our seven priority foods, the ones I mentioned, particularly for rice, porridge, and uh, ugali, maize flour, we then followed up at a local market where, um, where the vendors said that they purchased their, their supplies. And so we went to the markets and we identified suppliers of those produce and we sampled from them. So that was an observation of how they handle the food from the producers and suppliers and an SSI, as well as, sorry, a semi-structured interview and then a collecting a food sample for processing. And then finally, this, this is a very big study, as you can see. Um, so there, there's still a lot of analysis to do. We have um, the household survey and all the risk factors to analyze. Um, we have the food samples to process and we have some preliminary results from that. So in country, we culture for Salmonella, Shigella, and E. coli and Campylobacter. And we're also doing PCR for Cryptosporidium and Norovirus. You'll notice that most of these are also zoonoses. Uh, later, these samples, both the food and the stool, will be sent to LSHTM in the UK, where a TACMAN array card will be used to test for all those pathogens that were on that third slide that I spoke about, um, the ones that, that we haven't tested for so far. We also took a household water sample um, for E. coli, and the, there was the blood spot that I spoke about, and that will be tested for antibodies to um, infectious diseases. And then we had livestock samples and we cultured them. Um, the livestock stool samples were cultured for Salmonella, E. coli and Campylobacter. And then all of the SSIs, the semi-structured interviews and the observational data um, will be used to understand um, the risks um, of foodborne disease. Okay. Um, oh, and my slides on advantage. There we go. So preliminary results. Um, as I said, our target was uh, 500 households. We actually reached 590. Um, we went a little bit over our target. And the reason for that was that we didn't expect people to be particularly compliant with the stool sampling because of the way we did it, leaving a diaper and getting them to call us, um, and the blood sampling. And in fact, we did have some issues around blood sampling with particular religious groups um, and, and one, one notable occurrence where we, we had to actually destroy a blood sample that had already been collected because um, the, the one of the, the, the initial caregiver had consented, but then the, another parent declined. So um, so it, it was challenging and we didn't have everyone um, consent to every process. But I think we, our target was 500 and I think considering the limitations, we did reasonably well. Um, so this table is quite busy. So in the first round, which is the young children and caregivers, as I said, there were 590 households. But then when we moved into the observations, we did a random selection of 100 um, and actually reached 109 households. And then for the post-purchasing, not every caregiver wanted to go shopping. So we have 97 post-purchasing um, observations and 97 food samples. So whilst we were going to do the post-purchasing uh, observations and sampling, we actually interviewed the vendor at the same time to just kind of, we had teams, we had seven teams in the field every day. So it was easier to try and tie these things in together. So if the caregiver was going shopping, we would go with that person, do the observations for the purchasing and then do the vendor observations at the same time. And so we have, but not every vendor consented. So we have 84 vendor observations and, um, and, uh, and, and interviews. Uh, now the, the producers, um, as I explained earlier, a little bit more challenging, um, but we were able to identify 36 producers. And as I said, they're mostly fruit, vegetables and, uh, and milk. And then we, um, we filled the gap regarding the uh, dry goods, let's call them the rice, matoki, maize flour um, at the markets. So just moving on. So preliminary laboratory results, and I think this is what might be really interesting um, given what Sarah was talking about. So remember this is a cross-sectional study. So you're not going to expect particularly high prevalences of these um, bacterial pathogens in children because most of the children are healthy um, and they're not presenting to a hospital with diarrhea. So, and our results um, are consistent with what we would have expected. So if you look in the first column of children, we had 541 stool samples and uh, we had a prevalence of Campylobacter of 5%, E. coli of 1.57 of 3%. And Shigella and Salmonella were a lot lower. Um, now, I didn't mention we have a study on, within a study um, to pathotype all the E. coli. So we did culture E. coli, and you would expect to find E. coli, but not necessarily pathogenic E. coli. So we haven't done that work yet. So when I say here that 86% of children were culture positive for E. coli, that's every E. coli, but we are still doing the work to pathotype that. 
Um, food samples, interestingly, quite a low prevalence of the pathogens that we looked for by culture, this is. So we this does not include the PCR work that we're going to do for cryptosporidium or norovirus or the TACMAN array card. So at least at culture positive results um, were, were, uh, were not particularly high. Um, and not surprising because some of the food is cooked, so um, you, you, wouldn't, you may not be able to culture the bacteria. So it will be interesting to see how this differs to the to the more molecular based approaches that we're planning for and again we've we found quite a lot of e coli whether this is pathogenic e coli um, we still need to determine now interestingly in the livestock so livestock is kept by about a third of households in the study area um, as i said we didn't just sample the owning the households that were recruited we also sampled the um the the neighbors um, and we found quite high prevalence of campylobacter and E. coli 157, but very interestingly, low prevalences of salmonella. Um, Can you please try to wrap up? Oh yeah, I'm just finishing, sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I will just close up. So, uh, so I've said this already just about the discussion that the low prevalence of non-typhoidal salmonella in Kenya is, is consistent with other studies and the high prevalence of Campylobacter um, in chickens and pigs has been previously reported. Um, and as I said, the, the food sample analysis is ongoing. Um, so we still have quite a bit of work to do on the pathotyping. We're also doing some AMR work on all these culture bacteria, which uh, there are two students working on at the moment, which will be very interesting to see um, the the resistome for these uh, bacteria um, and then obviously I've spoken about the other tests uh, we still have to do all of our risk factor analysis and then the intervention design and testing which is planned for this year and will be guided by our results as well as key st stakeholder interviews which we're planning for this year so just to thank everyone it was a big team and a lot of work <laughs> anyway thank you very much Thanks a lot, Anna. You didn't have to rush through it that quickly. <laughs> it was just a warning that, that you're reaching the end. Thanks a lot That's for very that. Good. Very interesting presentation. Um, fascinating to hear that you were actually using motorbike riders on call to collect stool samples uh, whenever it was needed. I've never heard about that before. Um, yeah, we have a, a question um, from Sarah in, in the chat. Um, on what type of interventions that you are, um, type of interventions that you are expecting to use in the study? Oh, that's a very good question. And I, I'm not really sure that I'm in a position to answer that. So we, we are still processing all of these samples and the data, and, and we do want to use that together with our stakeholders to guide the interventions. Um, obviously, when we proposed the study, the idea was to think about interventions all along the value chain um, to, and, and where they might be most appropriate. And I think we'll still try and do that um, and base that on, on, the, on the results that we have. So um, yes, that, that's yet to be determined. So watch this space. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Annie, do we have any more questions? I, I don't see any more questions in the chat. And this is a perfect opportunity to ask Annie all the questions. If there are no more questions from the audience, I might ask a question when it comes to the methodology of the study. Uh, as I noticed that you were both doing interviews and you also did observations. Um, often there's a big discrepancy in when you do interviews that people think they are doing things differently than what they actually do in observations. So maybe you could elaborate a bit on the differences and similarities that you observed through your interview studies and your observations. So, so I can't quantify it because we haven't done that. Uh, that analysis, but you're absolutely right, which is why we triangulated it like this. So we have we have kind of three approaches. Um, we have a, a, a kind of data collection tool that was quite formal, and then we have the observation tool, and then we have the, um, uh, the so the first one was quite structured, um, yes, no kind of type answers, and the second one um, was observations, which the nurse would do, just sit and observe, did the did the caregiver wash their hands? Did the, did the caregiver wash the instruments? Where did they prepare the food? What kind of surface were the implements washed? That kind of what were they washed with? So that was the observational data. And then there was the SSI, the semi-structured interview, which asked the, 
the caregiver, did they do those things? And yes, you're absolutely right. So often what was observed and what was said um, were, were quite different and which is why we use the multiple methods approach because we did expect that when you ask someone if they did it, they would always say yes um, and it wasn't always the case. So, so we did make those observations to try and see exactly what people were practicing rather than what they were reporting. Thanks a lot. And uh, thanks a lot, Annie. Looking forward to see the, the, the results coming out of this project. A very interesting one, both the Kenya one and the Mozambique one. Um, with that, thanks a lot for joining us and for presenting. Uh, and I would like to introduce our next presenter, uh, Mr. Abdullahi Pedeomga from um, Burkina Faso, who has a background in nutrition and wash and is working as field coordinator at Africa Sante in Burkina Faso. Um, Mr. Abdullahi will present data from the Elsevier project um, on, uh, sorry, I lost my, my data here. <laughs> so uh, yes, on the, on the Elsevier project in Burkina Faso that is focusing on reducing the exposure to animal excreta as a part of WASH uh, initiatives in the community-led total sanitation approach. Um, he will use a mix of English and French um, so for those of you who don't know much French, this is a perfect opportunity to learn a bit of French. Uh, and of course, questions can be posted both in English and French. Uh, with that, over to you, Abdullah. Um, very happy to have you here. Okay, thank you, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure for me to, to try to share with you our experience in uh, the Celebrate Wash approach in uh, Burkina Faso. Next. Next. Hello. Sorry, Ab Sorry Abdullah. It's it's uh it seems there is a lag. Um, no, no, it came. Do you see it? Okay. Um. Yeah. Okay. Um. Celebe, uh mean uh, something like uh, to stand up to stand up. As you know, with uh, malnutrition, with malnutrition can uh, weaken the children and limit their capacity to stand up. So we try to to found this uh, acronym to 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 give the name of this project. In English, it means uh, supporting family farming to 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 launch poultry farming and enhance the rural economy. And uh, if pre and Africa Sunday are uh, responsible to uh, to to do the impact evaluation. And the implementation is did uh, with uh, by uh, Tanaja Wanjia, and uh, the part of wash is uh, lead with uh, local and Jesuit name is uh, APS. Next. Next. Yeah. Um, uh, Celebe project is uh, uh, an integrated project which combines uh, uh, agriculture mainly about uh, poultry production by the women um, uh, with uh, the training of them uh, to improve the access for credit for the with, for the women to 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 do this uh, farming and also encourage them to, to do vaccination of uh, poultry. And uh, the second comp uh, component is uh, behavior, uh, behavior change communication in, 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 in on good nutrition, uh, which combine uh, um, infant and young child, uh, and young child uh, feeding practice and uh, uh, pregnant women uh, uh, diet. And uh, we hope uh, we've, um, uh, we hope uh, through the, the consumption of eggs and meat by the children will contribute to, to, to reduce uh, malnutrition. Uh, conversely, um, if the uh, poultry production in an uncontrolled manner risk uh, aggravating the already pre precarious Asian condition in uh, rural area in Burkina Faso and can then limit the achievement of the project objective. As you know, in the pathway of malnutrition, the rule of uh, poor hygiene can, can occur uh, the, the malnutrition. So hygiene is considered a key tool to reduce the diarrhea and uh, uh, 
osteopathy uh, and very far also uh, malnutrition. Next. Indeed, uh, preview study and a formative research uh, we, we did in uh, 2016 uh, by if, uh, with IFPRI uh, showed that uh, in the in the three region we showed that uh, children and poultry shared the same space in 91% uh, of households. In 69% uh, of households, the compound required sweeping at the time of the survey and chicken dropping were visible in 70% uh, of households. Uh, as you know, in this condition, uh, the, the children can uh, be easily uh, infect with uh, uh, with uh, uh, with chicken uh, uh, excreta uh, if they uh, ingest uh, the, the excreta which is uh, uh, mixed in uh, the sand in the in the in the area, and only uh, fifty nine percent of those old had functional latrines. Next. <coughs> Uh, human excreta was visible in 6% of households. It, that is mean that uh, children uh, uh, don't use uh, something like box to do the, the excreta. They do it in the open air. Uh, in 58% of household livestock had access to the main source of drinking water. Um, we also observe that 58% uh, of children defect in the open. The faces of only 30% uh, of 13% uh, of uh, children had been thrown into a lottery. We also observe low practice of end washing in at the K moment and uh, a weak drinking water protection or water treatment. Next. Uh, so, uh, what approach we try to use to, to fight against this uh, condition, this poor hygiene condition? The main intervention in the Seleve approach project concerns the strength uh, of local poultry production, as we, we see it in the previous slide. So, then we, we try to add uh, a, a wash component was implemented for uh, ALF, the intervention village. We will see it uh, at the follow slide. In the wash village, a cell test approach with an additional livestock component was designed and used. Uh, we contracted with a uh, local NGO, uh, which name is uh, APS, and uh, which is specialized in cell test for this activity. Next. Here we have the, the, our uh, study design uh, uh, to go directly, I will say that we, 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 we had at the finally um, uh, 60 uh, municipality which, we, which uh, are divided to two groups. Uh, the first group is the, the, the treatment group which received the Seleve uh, uh, intervention uh, uh, 30 municipality, and we have the control village, uh, which are uh, uh, 30 municipality, uh, which constitute the, the control uh, com uh, community. So uh, this is the, the first level of randomization to, to compare the two groups. And in about our presentation, we, we will focus on the, the, the read square where we, we, you can see this is in the second uh, level of random use and, and we add in the, the half uh, village, uh, uh, treatment village, we, we had uh, a wash component which includes cell test. And at the end, we can compare uh, this group with the cell, sample cell group and also with the control group. Next. Yeah, here we have the map of, uh, of uh, our uh, study uh, area. And uh, you see in the yellow color, we have uh, the control group and the green color, we have the, the treatment group. Next. 
So, had I said in the part, in the previous slide, in addition to the traditional model of cell cell tears based on the management of human waste, uh, that means uh, build and use of light latrine, we add the management of poultry manner as being taken into account in the process. Uh, that means that we, we, we add in this process, in the traditional uh, process of cell tears, we add the quantification of animal dropping during the treasuring. Uh, this is for animal dropping during the environmental work, taking animal dropping into account when mapping excreta, use of animal dropping in the uh, degus, discuss test, estimation of health expen expenses due to the disease linking to poultry dropping. Next. Yeah, this part is co concerned the, the, the step of, uh, uh, of uh, cell test uh, process. At the first, the uh, APS team uh, went to the village and visit uh, the condition of, uh, of uh, hygiene and try to meet the leader of the village to explain, to explain why, what they have to do in the future. And we also have uh, pre triggering in which in which step we try to collect information uh, about uh, uh, um, about uh, uh, hygiene uh, uh, condition next next yeah here is the main part of uh, cell test uh, where we do the the treasuring and the first step is to do the village map where the, the emphasis on is on defecation area and animal dropping uh, very dirty, as you can see it in the, 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 the two maps. Um, and uh, you see uh, at uh, the, 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 the left, you have the adult uh, group and the, the, right, the, the right, you have the children group. Uh, and you can see in the above uh, map that uh, the yellow coloration is about uh, um, human pop in the bushes, and the red is uh, human pop around compounds, and black is uh, animal feces uh, around this uh, area. Next. Um, after that, we try to do pop estimation this consists of cal calculating the quantity of pop product produced by the community and the quantity of animal waste per day per week and per year uh, we try also to 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 visit place of defecation uh, open air defecation latrine and water point we try to encourage uh, and ask comprehension question while avoiding guiding the community. Uh, we also visit some compounds in order to appreciate the state of hygiene and to see the way in which domestic livestock are managed. Next. Yeah, here we try to do something like uh, uh, a test of uh, disgusting uh, in the, the the left you can see that uh, we try to give someone uh, water and he do, he don't like to, to 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 drink it because we, we put this water nearby uh, the feces and they fly go on the and the face and come back to the water and then if he see it he refused to consume this water uh, and the right, you can also say uh, the see the food nearby the feces, human feces and uh, animal feces. So uh, people will also see the fly, uh, which go to the to the to the feces and come back in the food. Uh, and then if you invite them to eat it, they refuse. But we can in this part tell them that you refuse to eat it now. But daily, every day, it's like this you eat uh, because you 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 do the the defecation in open eye and the the, the fly go in this uh, way and come back 
to your uh, food and you eat it uh, every day. Next. We try also to, to, to estimate uh, a medical uh, expenses. Um, and at the end, uh, we have something like uh, children's advocacy. After the child tries, two or three children will speak on behalf of all to convey, to convey their message to the, the parents. The parent will, in their turn, give an answer to, to children who will return to sit down to follow the rest of the activity in the adult. Next. Yeah, uh, here is the commitment and decision making. After analyzing the situation, the committee uh, agreed to stop open defecation. They raised the end and pledge to build latrine and also early adair are listed and on seat and will be closed monitored. Next. Yeah. Uh, here we can focus this part uh, on uh, uh, poultry wash. Um, here is uh, the post-treasuring follow-up, and uh, it's, con we, uh, it's concerned to, to establish of uh, the uh, establishment of village monitoring community. Uh, those community will uh, do the monitoring of uh, the realization of uh, the population engagement to 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 do uh, latrin and and uh, animals sp separate with uh, the, the the men so they can follow up of latrin achievement follow up of achievement of adequate poultry houses separation of animal habits of hab habitat from compounds monitoring of space equipped for children regular cleaning of yard yeah, um, and try to see if the population uh, adopt uh, the hand, hand washing practice. Next. Uh, this is the, 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 the preliminary view of the data is now uh, analyzing, uh, are now analyzing by IFPRI team. Uh, they sent us the, 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 the global view of uh, the result, the tendency of uh, the result now, and they show that uh, the wash approach used by has contributed to improve knowledge and promoting the adoption of good hygiene practice related to poultry farming. Some practices related to the separation of poultry and children have have also improved. It. However, it was also so that. No livestock wash practice did not improve in the Celeve plus wash group. It means that uh, the, the practice like uh, hand washing is not uh, well, is low adopted now. The this community, what we noted, uh, we can tell that is uh, this community had very low level of wash to begin with and improving wash in this community will likely require further intervention including infrastructure improvement uh, as i tell the uh, i told the uh, analyze of biodomical and are in progress next yeah lesson learned uh, we we can say that the wash approach of CLV project is an innovative extension of CLTS that has potential to address the local sanitation and hygiene and contribute to sustainable development. Uh, we, 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 we observe a strong interest of population in solving problems related to hygiene, awareness of health risk from a contaminated local environment, including cohabitation with animals, uh, uh, construction of many latrines with local materials, wood for the, the slabs and straw for the fences, uh, reinforcing of social cohesion through many activities which bring together several sub community in the village assembly. Next, uh, testing ways to, sep to separate livestock from human habitat, community monitoring through village sanitation community, 
and positive influence of uh, Nike boring village of uh, treasured village, dropping and over animal waste that are regularly sweep up of uh, uh, and group it together are sold for market gardening or use a compost as compost in the field. Next. Yeah, uh, the limit uh, we noticed that is uh, a insufficient uh, found or lack found for uh, reinforced and fairly extensive monitoring, um, absence of subsidies, especially for the poorest for uh, infrastructure construction like uh, latrine and chicken cups. Um, the construction of latrine with poor and um, sustainable materials like wood for the slabs, straw or plastic bags for the walls. Next. Yeah, uh, limited adoption of separating animals from domestic area due to the fear of teeth and the mode of poultry uh, feeding, free, uh, free ranging. As you know, in this area, uh, population is uh, poor and to, to feed the children, they try to let them go uh, at, uh, around the, the household to eat the rest of uh, uh, insect or the rest of food. Um, so it's a little difficult to, 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 to tell them, but they have to, to contain the poultry and give them every day uh, 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 the uh, uh, food. Um, we have also threat of deforestation by the use of uh, tree trunks for manufacture of Latin labels. How you can see in the picture, you see that we have to cut all the trees to do this uh, latrine. Next. On uh, next step uh, for the next step, what, what we can say is uh, ongoing analysis of final data, interviews and biomedical samples in control Seleve and Seleve Plus wash village. Uh, wash report uh, will be probably finalizing during this uh, year. And after that, we can uh, do a journal uh, publication. Next. Uh, thank for your attention. I think uh, you get something in my, during my, uh, my presentation. Thank you again.